What's up, hobby friends, and welcome to my two-part video series on painting the Hulk Buster suit. There are a number of great tutorials already out on YouTube going step-by-step -step through painting each of the different parts, and I don't think it's good value to actually go through painting each individual part of the Hulk Buster. Not that it wouldn't be informative, but I think that what I want to do with this video series is arm you with both a practical but also a theoretical knowledge on how to break down thinking through how to properly paint a full metal object like the Hulkbuster. Rather than just tell you to put a highlight here and a shadow here, I want to explain why we're putting highlights and shadows where we do, and hopefully this will better equip you to then look at another model that has a lot of non-metal metal and without even having a video tutorial on that, you can take this theoretical knowledge and begin to apply it to your own painting and grow your understanding of how to paint these complex miniatures. So part one of this video series is going to be the practical. I'm going to talk through the different color recipes that I use for painting this Hulkbuster miniature, and I'll demonstrate them on different parts of the model. And then part two of this series is gonna dive into the theoretical side. We're gonna talk a little bit about sort of the fundamental shapes, how we're dealing with light, how it travels, and then the materiality of an object and how it impacts um, not just how it's showing lights and shadows, but how it reflects. And this is really important for looking at metallic objects or metallic surfaces as secondary light sources. I'll then take a breakdown and look at the Hulkbuster and how we apply this theoretical knowledge on this miniature and think through some of the more complex parts and shapes of this model. To prime the Hulkbuster miniature, we're using Vallejo Surface Primer Black. And then I use the airbrush to apply a base coat of AK Tenebrous Gray over the entire model as well. To paint the non metal metal red armor, we're using scale colors African Shadow, AK Dark Shadow Flesh Tone, Carmine, Dead Red, and White, with some glazes of scale colors Ink Tensed Wood. Vallejo Game Air Warlord Purple, and Games Workshop Contrast Blood Angels Red. To paint the non metal metal gold parts, we're using Vallejo's Leather Brown, English Uniform, Japanese Uniform World War II, Ice Yellow, AK White, and then glazes with scale colors Ink Tense Wood, and Vallejo Game Air Warlord Purple. To paint the non metal metal silver parts, we're using AK's Ash Gray, Graphite, Pale Gray, Pale Sand, Greenish White, and white. To paint the arc reactors, we're using AK Blue Green, Pastel Blue, and white. I also use the same color to paint the blue parts of the smoke exhaust rail. To paint the khaki stone on the base, we're using AK Graphite, Scale Color Thar Brown, Mojave White, and White Sands. To paint the terracotta brick, we're using Scale Colors African Shadow, Kalahari Orange, Basic Flesh, and then to paint the mortar, Vallejo Tan Earth, and Ice Yellow. To paint the non metal metal track rail on the base, we're using AK Dark Sea Blue, Gray Blue, Spectrum Blue, and Greenish White. To paint the non metal metal copper sewer grate, we're using scale colors African Shadow, AK Saddle Brown, Deep Brown, and scale colors Tenere Yellow. And then, not pictured here, I also used Games Workshop's Vanilla Hack Oxide to do the rust and verdigris. To paint the smoke on the base, we're using AK Graphite, Medium Sea Gray, Pale Gray, and white, and I apply glazes with Liquitex Acrylic Ink Titanium White, Vallejo Game Ink Yellow, and Orange Red. Glazes with Chimera's Pathalo Green and Magenta are applied over the entire model selectively, and this is in all of the red, gold, and silver areas. And then some final highlights on edges and corners are applied with pure white. So when you build with a Hulkbuster, it can be tempting to want to sub-assembly this large model. It does make painting the components um, a little bit easier, especially around the legs and underneath the crotch. You avoid some of these awkward overhangs and angles. And then because he has a larger piece, it can make holding it um, a little easier if you're only working on an arm or a leg at a time. The problem is because this is a fully non-metallic model, I find that the challenge in working in sub-assemblies is making sure that your lighting is consistent. And it's for that reason that I think it's actually not worth 
to work on this model in parts, unless you're comfortable with a lot of dry fitting and you want to worry about sort of um, avoiding having your fingers rub up against any of the pieces, you're going to have to really think through how to hold each piece as you're painting. I think you just save yourself a lot of trouble, build it all together, and then just paint through it all. It'll be easier to consistently work through and um, line up all of your lights and shadows. There's no major issues when it comes to building the model, just follow the instructions, they're fairly straightforward. There are a few gaps and seams that we do have to account for. Because of the way that the model builds, some of these pieces are in halves that come together. And so you're gonna have uh, seam lines, particularly on the backs of the feet. There's a pretty big one on the torso where um, the front and back half meet. So there's a line running in the center. And then these cross lines don't exactly meet. So I had to use some put sort of fake it and then just connect the lines using a um, rubber sculpting tool or rubber uh, brush. And then on the forearms, on the top armor panels, and then on the underside, or I guess the front from this angle where the two halves meet, you're gonna have a, a pretty significant seam line as well. And you'll want to go ahead and fill that in. I'm using Milliput to do all of the gap filling on this model. It's a two-part epoxy putty. It air cures after a couple of hours. And I like using this because when wet or when moist, it's almost like a clay. You can use a brush or any sort of soft tool, push it around, and it works very, very well to, to shape. And once it cures, you can pin it, you can carve it, you can cut it and sand it, almost like it was um, well, clay, basically. And it's for that reason that I prefer it over using something like green stuff or brown stuff where it can be tricky to get it perfectly smooth without being too chunky, um, very difficult to sand and polish afterwards. And then for the size of these seams, I think Vallejo plastic putty is a poor choice. You're going to end up having to do a lot of layers to fill the seams. And at the same time, it doesn't sand as well as Milliput does. So use what you feel comfortable with. Um, I do recommend using Milliput to do the gap filling for this. So once the Milliput has dried and has been sanded, we can now begin and start to prime the miniature. So we're using Vallejo Surface Primer Black. And I'm just going to apply a nice solid coat over the entire miniature. And once the primer is dry, we can give the model a once over and everything looks good. All of the gaps and the metal put um, gap filling, uh, everything looks uh, pretty spot on. So it's time to move on to airbrushing our first pass. So I'm going to be using a common color, in this case, AK Tempest Gray as a sort of deep shadow tone for all of the elements. So the gold, the red, and the silver. So rather than paint it by hand, I'm just gonna airbrush it on, on this model. And then we'll do a nice thin pass over everything. And then from there, we can mix Tempest Gray into our base colors for the red, gold, and silver, and build up from there. So before we dive into actually covering, painting the different areas of Hulkbuster, I want to briefly talk about the color recipes I'm using and sort of my approach to how I've been painting the Hulkbuster so far. You can see that I've actually done quite a fair bit on him already, mainly to nail down the color recipe and to really feel comfortable in painting this before I start recording it. So you can see on my palette, I have my red, my gold, and my silver with some washes in between and then some contrast. It's a very limited color palette. There's not a whole lot going on and it's all about sort of nuancing and using the placement of lights and shadows to create that visual interest rather than having a lot of colors. So we use Tenebris Gray as the base coat over the entire model and I have some on my palette to help with some black lining. And then for the reds, we start through, I believe this is Scale Colors African Shadow, AK's Dark Shadow Flesh Tone, Carmine Dead Red, and White. And essentially for the red, we're just blending all the way through. For the gold, again, with our Tenebris Gray as our base tone, we highlight up through, this is Vallejo's leather brand, English uniform, Japanese uniform World War II, ice yellow, and white. And then for the gray, we have AK Ash Gray, graphite, 
pale gray, pale sand, and greenish white. I'm going to talk through the colors again and throw them up on the screen when we cover each section individually, but very briefly for the approach. Um, with the Hulkbuster, because I'm painting the parts, depending on what part I'm painting and sort of which part is underneath, what parts overlap, I end up having to bounce around between the three colors. So it helps to have all three mixes on my palette ready to go. So as I'm painting, um, let's say, this segment in the shoulder, it's silver underneath. So I'll start with the silver, and then there's a gold armor plate on top, so I'll jump to the gold. And then here, this is red, so I'll jump to the red and red there as well. On the forearm, for example, it's gold underneath, so I'm going to start with the gold, um, tackle a bit of the silvers for the limbs here before jumping into the red. Something like this foot, for example. I would have started with the gray as the underneath. I would have done the red and then the gold. You can tackle the entire model however you want all at once in segments. Um, if you want to tackle all of the silver and then the red and the gold or in whatever order you choose, it's up to you. The way I did it was in segments so that I wouldn't be rushing. I wouldn't be inclined to, to push through and be sloppy in my painting. And this also allowed me to focus in on each area, really think through and not just paint on autopilot. One of the challenges of this model, and I'll cover it, probably not in the, the recipe segment, but in another segment where I actually walk through sort of thinking through the placement of lights and shadows, the model will be complete by then. And I can actually show you sort of what I was thinking and my rationale behind it. It can be very easy when painting a large model like this to want to just autopilot. And once we lay down a, a highlight, we start just blending through the colors without even thinking. And we're like, oh, there's an edge here, so there must be a highlight. And we just go all the way through. For me, on a complex piece like this, by tackling each individual segment, I can think, okay, for this piece, where are my highlights coming from? Where is my primary light source? Is it impacting this? And then we're talking about metallic surfaces. What about reflected light? Um, what areas around it are going to be bouncing light back in and creating some secondhand reflected light sources? And then once we get the colors down, we jump into the glazing and the nuancing. So here I have scale colors, ink tense wood. I have uh, Game Air's World War Purple, and I also have some Kings Workshop Contrast Blood Angels Red. I use these three colors to help nuance all the, for now, the red and the gold, using the uh, intense wood to ramp up the saturation of the gold, add a bit more orange tones um, in some of the mid and shadow tone areas, and in the red, if it's adjacent to a gold, I'll use this to nuance it and add a bit of orange um, sort of nuancing or reflection into the armor um, to create a, a variety of tones. So the first thing that we're going to want to do before we even get into any of the blending is to sort of map out um, what areas are going to be what material. So for the silvers, we're going to start with our um, ash gray, and we're just going to apply a nice, clean, even base coat. So I've already done the mapping and painting on one hand, so I know exactly what areas here are going to be silver, red, and gold. You want to make sure that your paints are nice and diluted. Um, we're going for a fairly even base coat, although if a little bit of that tentative gray peeks through, not a big deal. So we'll use ash gray to base coat any silver elements, any gold elements. We're going to use that leather brown. And when you're base coating, you want to make sure that you're leaving that tentative gray as your black lining. Do your best to be as neat as possible with this. Although if you make a mistake, we have a ton of gray on the palette and it's not a big deal to go back in and correct. And then for any red areas, we're gonna use um, that African shadow. And it's gonna apply a nice even base coat, although if any of that ton of gray sort of peeks through a little bit, if it's uh, um, not entirely smooth, not a big deal. So now with our base coat stone, we can begin to start painting each of the different segments. I'm gonna start with the gold and then work our way to the silver and the red in terms of um, the one, two, three of the color recipes. But again, as I mentioned, um, if you're working on this in pieces, working from the inside out, you may have to adjust and alternate which colors you're painting based on the way the plates overlap. So for example, you can see that as part of my base coating, I've already painted in some of the gold here, 
because the red armor plate overlaps. So in order to do the red, I wanted to do the gold, shade that in first, and then base coat the red on top. I haven't base coated the fingers yet because I still need to um, brace my hand on a part of the model and I'll get the fingers and the fist of both hands. But I've done some of the silver work on the joints in anticipation of painting the fingers on afterwards. And you can see that gold carried through. So once again, the color recipe for the gold from our tenebrous gray, we have Vallejo's leather brown, English uniform, Japanese uniform World War II, ice yellow, and then AK white. So on top of our leather brown, we're going to start painting in our English uniform. Now, before you even put your paint to the, the brush in terms of highlighting, we want to start thinking through placement of our lights and shadows. And we're looking at two main sources. We're looking at highlights from our primary light source. So on this model, my light source is three quarters top down in this direction, which means that in the way he's facing, we're probably gonna get a pretty strong highlight here on this upper part of the band. You can see that I'll be carrying that through from the front all the way through. Because this isn't, um, on the angle of it, directly facing all the way through, we're only gonna get a really strong, almost white highlight on the top curve here. And as it goes down, much like a cylinder, it's gonna fade quickly into my mid and my shadow tone. So we're gonna start with that, start blocking that in. And because I have the color nice and diluted, I'm able to basically just um, pull and feather the color out without any real mixing. The colors in this recipe, for the most part, up until you get to uh, that Japanese uniform, uh, are fairly transitionary in value in that it's not too stark of a jump. So if you dilute enough and you're comfortable with feathering, um, you'll be able to pull the colors through without really having to, to blend too much. Now, at the same time, we also want to start thinking about our secondary light source. That is, um, light or highlights are reflecting off of either something behind in the environment or in some of the, the armor panel around the actual piece that we're painting. So for example, um, if our primary light source is coming from three quarters top down, that means three quarters bottom up, something in the environment is going to be reflecting some light. So I'm going to take the area opposite that which will be on the back here. And I'll also throw in some highlights here. So that's gonna be a highlight section on the bottom part of the cylinder. And you can see that I've already considered a part of that too on the front, which means that we're just gonna carry it through and we'll get a little bit over here as well. We also want to consider the armor around this piece that will be catching our light and then reflecting it, essentially becoming a secondary light source. So this gold panel right here is the most obvious one. The primary light source is hitting this, it's bouncing, and it's scattering all over the place, which means that some of the light catching from here is going to bounce into here, which means that we're going to have to have a highlight somewhere on the bottom right here as well to account for this fact. Something you have to consider as well is that when it comes to reflected light, reflected light is never as strong as the actual source of light itself. So whatever value from here that's creating that reflection and bouncing here has to be brighter than whatever highlight you're placing in here, which means that for the most part, because the highlight goes up to about ice yellow here, I'm safe in keeping the highlights on the underarm, probably in the 50-50 English uniform, Japanese uniform color. And then finally, we're gonna have some edge highlights. Um, the way I like to approach this 
is essentially to throw a highlight on every single edge because especially if it's adjacent to another metallic object, you're gonna have some light bouncing off that and catching on those corners. The degree of brightness, remember again, can never be brighter than what's bouncing the light to begin with. So you're gonna wanna think through each edge and highlight appropriately. So as I'm highlighting up, I'll try and explain it, but as an example, this edge right there is facing towards the light source, our primary light source. So this is going to be fairly bright. So let's, for example, let's say we're going to make that ice yellow. I'm going to want to put a highlight on this edge as well. However, because this is probably bouncing off of this edge, some metallic around it, and this, it's not going to be as bright. So maybe I'll take that up to the Japanese uniform and not the ice yellow. I know I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. We haven't even gotten to ice or Japanese uniform on the major highlights, but I'm just sort of explaining the, the process of thinking through the highlights as we go. All right, similarly on this edge, we'll probably have to have um, some ice yellow because it's facing primarily our light source as well as some of the red armor immediately adjacent. So it might end up being a little brighter there. And then on this reverse, um, maybe that Japanese uniform again. Because we're getting some bounce highlights from armor panels here, as well as the silver joints right there. So those are the sorts of things that you want to be thinking through as you're um, laying down your highlights, as you're working through the blends. And a large part of, or a large reason why I want to tackle each of these um, panels individually because this allows me to really think through um, each piece of armor as opposed to doing it all at once all over the entire thing and having to consider everything. It can be a little overwhelming, a little daunting, and it's a lot of, I guess, mental gymnastics to have to think through lights and shadows and reflected highlights and all bounce light and everything for everything on the model all at once. I think it's much more manageable if you're working on it component by component and you only have to think through a handful of edges and surfaces. So for this primary highlight, we're essentially just working our way up through Japanese uniform. Again, no intermediate colors. We're just using some diluted paints and we're um, feathering the color skirts. You don't have to do the blends perfectly smooth. Um, the Hulkbuster um, armor, because it was built to fight um, creatures like the Hulk, it's going to see a lot of wear and tear, a lot of battle damage, even right out of the gate. If you watch it in the film uh, The Age of Ultron, the moment Tony Stark deploys the Hulkbuster suit from Veronica, it's no longer perfect. Um, when you look, and I was um, freeze framing and stepping through that Age of Ultron fight between the Hulkbuster and the Hulk a lot when I was trying to build my references, really take a look and analyze at the armor panels. They're not factory clean, they're not perfectly fresh. You're, you're getting a lot of undulation and a lot of unevenness in the highlights. And this is a combination of both the wear from the uh, armor sustaining damage in battle, or just from use, as well as environmental lighting around it. From the Japanese uniform, we're gonna start mixing our ice yellow. And here's where we want to mix in a few intermediary steps just to um, help that transition along. But if you want to suggest a, a very stark highlight or some, some object that's creating a highlight, um, you might want to go a little more sun. So for example, on the chest here, you can see how I've got this sort of uh, pinky white band that's very sudden in terms of the jump from here down to there. So what I'm trying to suggest is that there is some object or something here creating a stronger light source, and then maybe something here that's creating a shadow that's creating that uh, divide in value. 
gonna put some highlighting on these edges right here because I'm imagining some reflection catching off of this silver shoulder panel. And then I'm also paying attention to each of these internal edges as well. Highlighting the edges just like I did for these little bands here on the side. And when you start getting to your edge highlights, I recommend trying to be as crisp and as neat as possible with your brush strokes. Um, one, for the sense of scale, having really thin, really crisp um, brush strokes helps imply a very sharp, very razor, razor thin edge, which helps to belie the actual scale of the miniature. You want it just sharp enough where it's still visible, it still picks up, but not too thick where um, it looks like there's either a very large rounded corner or it looks sloppy from a brush uh, stroke or painting perspective. So I'll go ahead and develop the um, bottom and underside highlighting off camera simply because it's just a bit of blending. Just remember as you're highlighting that your values can't be brighter than what's causing the reflection. So we'll worry about that um, as we do. From our ice yellow, I want to start mixing in a little bit of white. Now I'm not gonna go to pure white yet. The reason being I want to leave white as the final value that I can use to tweak the entire piece overall. If I start locking in my white values now, it's gonna be very hard for me to adjust the focus of where my highlighting needs to be on the miniature, and it may end up throwing a lot of the values off balance. Um, so far, the only instances of pure white that I've used are on the eyes, this pet panel right here on the forehead, and the arc reactor on the chest. I haven't done any of the arc reactors on the knees, on the legs, and the hands. Those will also go up to pure white. But for here, um, I want to go maybe 50-50 ice yellow white and just continue to refine some very bright spots. And I'm limiting this highlight more or less to this top corner right here. Mainly because this curve, this armor panel, doesn't face my light source directly. It's a little bit off center. Only this little piece may catch some of that direct light the rest of it is um, curving off into the shadow or catching reflected bounce light. So for the time being, I'm really only going to throw in this 50-50 ice yellow light on this little corner right here. So now that we have our highlighting on the gold done, it's now time to do a first pass of washes to just throw in a bit of nuancing, bump up the saturation a bit, and start to think about um, influencing some of the color of the gold based on the local objects around it. So we're going to be using um, some Inktense Wood from Scale 75 and Warlord Purple from Vallejo Game Air. I'm going to be using the Inktense Wood. Um, to add a bit of that orange sepia tone to areas where we want a bit of richness. This will primarily be in areas where I'm getting more direct light um, adjacent uh, areas around that. So for example, right here, I might throw in some of this intense wood. Make sure that it's nice and diluted. You want to be able to build up the color. Try not to do it all in one go. It's much easier to add more of this wash, much harder to take away. And I've left this um, gauntlet unwashed because I want to walk through um, some of that Warlord purple as well. I don't think this um, arm bracer gets much of that. 
And we can go back and forth between the two colors. It's nice to be able to mix the two and um, sort of combine them to create a much more interesting shade. So where we're going to be using the Warlord Purple is in areas um, twofold. One, where it's going to be in the shadow side or the cooler side, and also where we have red armor adjacent. I'm imagining some of this um, red armor being captured and reflected in sort of that gold color and sort of um, subtly shifting it. Now, we could use red, but I find that the pink adds a much softer effect rather than using red directly. So right on the underside here, where we have a bit of this chest plate, I think it'll reflect a little bit in the gold here, so we'll add some of that pink in there, or more purple. And by keeping it nice and soft, we're still maintaining that gold color, but you can tell it's it's adding just that little bit of extra um, rosiness to the color. On the back here, where we're going to have um, this part of the gauntlet armband, I don't know what they call it. Let's throw a little bit of that purple in here as well. Soft enough to influence the color without shifting the value too much or shifting the saturation too much. On the bracelet here as well, we have all this red around, so we're just going to uh, really focus this color into our mid and shadow tones. Try and preserve your highlights. Don't try and wash too much over that ice yellow or that ice yellow white. Once again, a lot of red armor adjacent, so we're just going to focus this into the mid-tones and our shadows. And then under here, because we have this uh, gold, I don't know what you call this, punchy thing, this gold uh, plate, it's going to be sitting on top. I want to really ramp up the saturation in the shadow here, so we'll just throw in a little more intense wood. And then the same thing on the reverse because we're going to have that gold reflecting in. Let's ramp up the saturation here as well. So we're going to be painting um, this little segment right here. Keep it nice and simple. I don't want to be flipping around too much. The basic process to painting the silver in terms of thinking through your highlights and your shadows is the same as the gold and it'll be the same for the red as well. Once again, the colors we're using on top of our tenebrous gray, we're using a ash gray, graphite, pale gray, pale sand, and greenish white. Much like with the gold, we're going to avoid going straight to white as well here, saving that for our final nuancing and our final highlighting. So we're going to have our graphite base coated on top, sorry, our ash gray. So our next step is to take our graphite. Now ash gray graphite, and then all the way through these colors, it is a little starker in terms of the value jump compared to the gold. So you'll want to mix a few intermediary steps, to help you smooth out those blends. And essentially we're just doing a um, progressive blend through these colors, thinking through our highlights in much the same way. I want a sort of strong highlight up top here because that's where our direct light is coming from. And then we'll get some bounce light happening from the shoulder pad here as well as the torso right here, torso plate. We're just working our way through graphite. Into that pale gray. And I know this piece of armor in particular is fairly smooth, but where you're gonna have changes in facing, really think through if you can wrap up the, the jump between your values. For example, if you look at this chest plate right here, top and then the side, um, I've got a, a jump in value with a nice sharp highlight to help separate the two on the abdomen right here, where it changes facing. I've got a pretty strong highlight, bright value here, right beside a mid dark tone 
immediately adjacent. And that's how we can try and sort of sell that non-metal model effect is to find areas or places where we can ramp up that value jump and have that contrast between our bright brights and our dark darks. Uh, as I'm highlighting up, you can see that I'm thinking through sort of what patterns are going to be reflected onto the armor panel itself and sort of what's causing them. So what I'm thinking right now is this shoulder pad is going to create a soft highlight that follows sort of the shape or that edge of the armor. As we get underneath, so into here, even though it, the armor should be bouncing some light around, it is shadow, and so we're going to have that strong highlight right beside a shadow tone, particularly underneath the pad here. I don't think I get it on camera. Right in here. And then because this facing faces towards, um, I guess it's perpendicular to where the primary lights was happening, this is gonna actually be in shadow. So if you remember um, sort of our basic color theory in terms of how we approach um, analyzing how light plays on an object, if you imagine a sphere where you have the brightest light source or the highlight coming down, and the reflected light in the back, that terminus, that line in the middle that divides the front and the back from our primary light and our reflected light is actually the darkest part of the shadow. That's what we're capturing right here before it curves all the way around. So this part actually hits a fairly decent shadow here. I'm gonna reinforce that a little bit with my ash gray. And then over here, um, I don't want it just to be a bright to dark shade. I want to accentuate that line from the reflected light of the shoulder pad. And so I'm going to add a bit of a mid-tone separation there before adding a dot of highlight here. And then we'll fade that into the shadow as well. And then once we get to that bottom edge, we're going to get some highlighting reflecting off of this edge right here. So I want this edge to be bright. I'm meeting that up with some of my base tones. And the important thing too is to be consistent with your highlighting. You need to carry your highlights across um, multiple surfaces and edges. So something that you really have to be careful about is the direction of a particular armor or a particular panel, not just in relation to your primary light source and then how it's going to be capturing and reflecting light from objects around it, but how have you highlighted existing panels around it because you have to carry those highlights through if the panels are facing in the same direction. So something what I mean by that is right here. I have a highlight line running in different degrees of value running across right here. It's carrying across multiple panels because I need to be consistent. I'm considering where these armor panels are facing 
here, this butt plate. I'm imagining this internal armor, this internal plate right here, the way it's angled like this, is a little bit brighter than this. I'm hoping to capture that in camera very well. So if this panel here is slightly darker in this direction and brighter in this direction, that means that this panel, which bumps again, is darker. This panel right here that goes like this has lost the shadow. If this is my bright point right here, right, it gets darker as it curves in either direction. So when it goes like this and curves like that, it's back to darkness. But then for this panel right here, where it turns back out and matches this um, sectional panel right here, it's going to be brighter again. So these are the things you have to think about um, as you're approaching your highlighting as well is how have you applied your highlights on armor plates adjacent to it and even throughout the mall because um, obviously these armor plates and panels aren't only the ones facing in this direction. You might have a, um, a panel on the leg, this part right here, that's sort of angled the same direction. Um, maybe this panel right here and this top surface right here angled in the same direction also match this. So you have to think through the entire piece, look at what you've painted, and um, really think about where the armor panel actually sits in relation to your light sources, as well as other panels around, and paint according to match. That's why I think it's really important and really helpful to tackle this piece one plate at a time, because there's so much to consider. And it's also why something like this does take a long time. To paint it well, to paint it really true, it does take a lot of work a lot of effort, a lot of, of mental gymnastics to actually think through how you're placing your highlights, you're placing your shadows, you're thinking through what's reflecting, how strongly is it reflecting, um, how is the highlighting and shading on this armor panel behaving, and is it being consistent with everything else that you've painted on the model? So bringing it back in this instance, for example, I've got a highlight right here on the gold plate right here. It's going to have to carry through in terms of relative value up here as well. Now, I don't have to match it all the way because where I have it brightest on this gold panel, it's angled something like this. So it really only has to match up top here. This down here does curve and match a little bit away. So this can be darker in value. From our pale gray, we're going to start mixing in some pale sands. Now, I'm not going to be taking the undercut of this armor fairly bright. Um, it's probably going to sit somewhere in this red tone right here maybe this right here. So I don't want to take this reflected light too bright. In fact, I think it's probably a little too bright right now, but that's okay. We can just go back in with a very thin glaze of our base tone. So I'm using ash gray for this. Not too much water. And we're just gonna knock it back with a few glazes. This will also help to smooth out this um, blend right here. I'll capture a strong pale sand highlight right on this corner, this curve right here, because it matches the angle of this gold right here. And we're also going to put a thin highlight on the top of that armor panel because the edge is facing upwards towards our primary light source. So I think that is going to get a sharp highlight. We'll catch some reflections off of the gold, so we'll put a bit of a, a nice edge highlight right here. 
And then we'll finish off with some greenish white. Um, again, just a straw highlight right here. It's a little dot, but I want it to pop right here. And then I'll put the same on the corner right here. Something that's also really important is to not neglect the depth of the armor. So on this shoulder pad, for example, right here, you want to make sure that you're also highlighting and shading these large panels, these large cuts, to reflect the depth or the thickness of the armor. And don't just paint like a base coat or a shadow tone or whatever, just um, leave it unpainted. A little detail like this can really add to the depth of a model and give it some, some weight and um, particularly in this instance, some scale. You can even go so far as to freehand it in. So on this panel right here on the red, this entire section is flat. There's nothing there, there's nothing sculpted. I understand it's a limitation of the casting process um, to be able to cast this piece. They left it flat and undetailed. But what I did was I freehanded in a border and then highlighted and shaded that armor accordingly to account for the fact that this plate is a solid piece and I have to use reference for this. There is some detailing underneath here, but I imagine it's all hidden in shadow. Um, we're not going to worry about showing it. Really, it's an abstraction anyways. You can see how just that little detail alone gives that chest so much more weight and thickness as opposed to just um, leaving a black or just leaving an edge paint right there, an edge highlight and nothing else. Also, by accounting for this gap right here, we give a little bit more realism, like the arm is connected to some internal mechanism on the side here and not just sort of slapped on the edge of the toy. To paint the red armor, again, the recipe is scale colors African shadow, which we've reapplied as a sort of a base tone on top of AK's canvas gray. And then we're highlighting up through uh, dark shadow flesh, carmine, dead red, and then white. I'm going to be demonstrating this technique or a recipe on this piece of armor right here, mainly because it's, it's simple, easy to keep on camera, and then I can also demonstrate the fact or the method of keeping our highlights consistent across multiple planes of armor. On top of our African shadow, we're gonna go straight into our dark shadow flesh tone. So this is going to form the majority of our shadow tone. However, unlike the the gold and the silver, where it hits into deep shadow, you're going to want to actually leave some of that African shadow showing. And you can also start thinking about um, highlight shapes or highlight patterns across the armor. If you actually look at this ab plate right here, this spot right here is actually pure African shadow showing through, whereas this is sort of like a 50-50 glaze in between. Um, leaving something like this helps to give a little bit more depth and a little bit more information on the armor instead of just a flat blend. And especially when we get to start uh, painting large curves or rounded plat panels, you can really have fun with sort of the shapes and what you're trying to convey in terms of um, what around you, your environment, especially on these plates right here, is actually creating these reflections. And then we're treating it also because they're like spheroid cylinders. They're behaving as such, creating those uh, circle highlights for a sphere, leading into those high lines of a cylinder. This panel is relatively flat. There's not much of a curve to it. Um, a little bit on here, so we'll treat it kind of like a cylinder, but like broadly speaking, it is still relatively flat. And then we have a bunch of flat panels all the way around. Now, you may find you have to go back in with some glazes of tenderness gray just to help reinforce some of the black lining that may have been lost in the base coat or sketching phase. Okay, and then on top of the dark shadow flush, we're gonna go right into Carmine. Now, Carmine, despite being a high value paint right out of the pot, is actually fairly translucent in coverage. With just a little bit of dilution, it's actually very easy to get this color 
to glaze on top of the dark shadow flesh. So we're just going to start to build up to pure uh, carmine. And this color is actually going to be the majority of our mid-tone. And you can see that as I'm highlighting up, I'm following the planes of the armor. These top panels where they angle like this are catching direct light from our light source. So they're gonna be fairly bright. And so I'm intentionally gonna be keeping this side plate right here, fairly mid-tone to create that contrast, that jump between bright and dark. Uh, this panel, uh, we'll get some reflected light on the edges. So I'm gonna do some very sharp edge highlights with that carmine. And then on the underside right here, I think um, to balance out some of the darkness that's happening here, I may get just a bit of Carmine right in this little corner. Get some reflected light happening from here. And again, have that um, value jump from sort of a dark to a mid-tone, mid-tone bright. From Carmine, we're gonna start introducing our dead red. You'll wanna mix a few intermediary steps and the goal is to work our way up to pure dead red. If you want, and if it'll help you, you can start with pure dead red, block in where you want some of your stronger highlights to be, and then mix in your intermediaries as a way of smoothing out the blends or creating those transitions. So I'm putting pure dead red right here on this corner because I imagine it's going to fade into a bit of that carmine shadow in the back. Once we have it blocked in, we can take a 50-50 mix and then just sort of uh, stipple, glaze, however you want to do it, depending on how smooth you want the transition. If you want something sharper like this, you'll um, do less steps in between, have a, a much more sudden jump. If you want a smoother blend, then you'll want to do a lot of extra steps to, to blend the colors together. And then from pure dead red, we're gonna start introducing white. I'm not gonna go all the way to pure white. Again, saving it for the final step of the miniature. Um, but working my way up to say like a 50-50 or a 70-30. At this stage, you wanna be very careful, very precise with your highlights. And you wanna avoid um, over pinking the miniature. Too much of these highlights will make the armor look pink and not red. So the key is to be very sparing with these and selective with how how much you go up to these bright highlights. And we'll finish off with some very sharp highlights on the edges of the armor. Brighter in the front where it's facing direct. And then we'll put some dots on the corners here to catch a little bit of a sparkle or sort of a spot highlight that's coming from our reflected light sources. I think this 
the front edge needs a bit of a brighter highlight too. Now again, you want to be as sharp and as precise as possible with these highlights. If you do need to correct, for example, here, I'm just getting a bit of carmine and I'm erasing that highlight to sharpen it back up. You want to be as precise and as, um, as, as sharp as possible with these edge highlights to really get that sense of, of um, scale for one for the miniature. And it just makes the entire thing much or feel much tighter as an overall paint job. So here we have the armor on this part, basically painted up all the way full. I've painted the extra armor plates on the side so you get a sense of how I'm carrying the highlights across. So these top panels right here, right across here, and then even on these little um, under plates, they all follow the same plane direction which also matches this top of the curve right here and this curve of the silver. So we're gonna be painting them in sort of that same high tone brightness. And we do carry that across. I'm gonna be painting that um, four arm plate right here in the same manner, my hat across here, over to here with a shadow right there because of the way that the light's hitting, our shadow's reflecting off of this plate right here. This plane does also carry across into the chest Somewhere right here, the angle doesn't have to be exact, so we know that this relative value should match somewhere along here. Okay, these are the things that we need to be thinking about as we work our highlights and shadows along each plate, like I've been saying. You really want to make sure that you're not autopiloting this and that you're working through and thinking through every part of um, every armor plate on the miniature. Once we have it right now, we're gonna go back in with some glazes using our intense wood our Warlord Purple, and then we're also going to introduce some Blood Angels Contrast. So we're going to start, the order doesn't matter, you can go back and forth. I'm going to start with some intense wood, and much like when we were doing the gold, sort of any areas that's adjacent to gold plates, I want to glaze in some of that intense wood. Try and preserve my highlights, and you can see that just a little bit of this color is enough to push the value into sort of an orange um, sepia tone without over strengthening and then taking away from the red. Right? And you can sort of see what I've done right here with that as well. Uh, you can see a little bit right here on this bottom on the insides underneath the plate right here. It's very, very subtle, but it's enough to shift it away from sort of that pinky red into an orangey, an orangey red, orangey pink. Uh, you can build up this intensity as much as low as you want. And again, try not to put it everywhere. Just put it where you need to, where it makes sense. The idea is to have a variety of color in the armor. With that applied, we can take our Warlord Purple. I, on the red, like to focus this in my brighter area. Just to shift the color a little bit. And this you can glaze over your highlight. It has a, a nice effect of um, smoothing out some of the transitions, but also shifting away from necessarily sort of a, uh, a more pastel red into something a little bit more, uh, more fuchsia in tone. It's again, very subtle, but the idea is to create nuance. And then finally, we'll go back in with our Blood Angels Contrast in areas where we want sort of a rich red um, really start to punch in and reinforce our shadows, for example, right here on this plate. Or it's not being influenced by any of the pink or the intense wood. I'll just do a glaze and it'll help to really up the saturation of that red. I'm going to catch a little bit in the deep shadow here. So there are a number of arc reactor boosters all over the Hulkbuster armor. There's one on the chest, 
The eyes are painted the same way. There's one in the palm of his hand, a couple on his boots or on the knees, the inside of each one, as well as the back. And then a few in the backpack and then the exhaust vents on either side of the torso. This is a very simple recipe. We're using AK Blue Green as our base coat, and then we're highlighting with AK Pastel Blue and White. So you can see that I've already base coated these arc reactors, and I did this before painting any of the metallic elements. The reason being because we're going for a soft OSL glow effect, and we want to get this blue all the way up on the edges. Doing this before the non-metal metal silver around meant that I could basically neaten up the edges by painting the silver, and I could be sloppier with the base coat of the blue because I was done first. To achieve that OSL look, that sort of soft glow, we want to make sure that we get this blue-green color right up along the edges and a nice even base coat all the way on the inside. You want to make sure that it's not glowing on the outside because that's not how light behaves. Light travels in straight lines, so once it hits the edge, it's not going to then spill over onto the edge or onto the outside. When we go into the nuancing phase in areas like underneath here, we might actually see a bit of blue glow and we'll get to that when we um, start to finalize the model. But for now, we're going to focus on the reactors on the inside. So once we have our blue-green base coated, we're just going to take our pastel blue, and we're just going to go straight into the, the center of the reactor. We mix a bit of uh, blue-green in there just to help us apply a nicer base coat. And all we're looking to do is blend up to pure white. So I'm gonna do both of these at once just so I can give each one time to dry as I'm painting. You wanna be careful just to leave a bit of that blue-green showing through on the edges. And if you're painting a reactor on the chest that has that inner lip, we want to paint that inner lip or that inner edge separately, leaving some of that blue-green showing. So what I did for this arc reactor is I actually painted that edge first so I could be a little sloppier. Then I used blue-green to neaten up the center again before painting in that white highlight. So we're just going to keep working our way into that pure pastel blue. And again, you want to make sure that you're leaving some of that blue-green on the edge there. You don't want to fill it all the way to the edge of the circle. Now from here, we're just going to start mixing in our white into our pastel blue and we're going to highlight up into pure white. We're going to be focusing these highlights, um, I would say, in the upper half. Although if you really wanted, you could focus it in the center and sort of just focus in uh, narrower and narrower highlights. That's OK, too. So all we're doing is we're just mixing in progressive amounts of white and we're just gently painting smaller and smaller um, circle highlights. And because the value jump from pastel blue into white is fairly close, fairly similar, we're not going to have to do many, uh, many steps or many highlight layers. And then because they are uh, naturally much more translucent paint, not super opaque, we're using a white dilution. It's very easy to, to glaze and blend these two colors together without much effort. And that's it. It's nice and simple. The arc reactor has a very strong white glow to it, so there really isn't um, much effort beyond just bringing it up to pure white from that light blue. 
when you're painting um, these sockets like this, again, it's really important to fill in that entire socket. So you can see on the eyes, I've done the blue all the way to the edge. There is no black lining on that. The black lining is the blue. With the Hulkbuster pretty much 80% painted, we're going to move on to the base, get that painted in first, establish those values before moving back to finalize the piece with some extra nuancing and final highlights. So I'm going to start with a base coat of AK Graphite over the khaki stone. So basically, we're going to do terracotta brickwork on the side. Over here, we're going to have a copper sewer grate. We're going to have a non-metal metal steel uh, track over here. And then we're going to be doing khaki for these stones on the left. So I'm going to apply a couple of coats with my AK Graphite, and I'll go ahead and I'll base coat the smoke with this as well. Um, you can see there's a bit of um, white epoxy putty and gloss. What I was doing was I was just sort of gap filling and smoothing out those parts as I was working on the model. Um, just to hide sort of those mold lines and seam lines and uh, gap fill so that the smoke uh, transitions smoothly into the base. So once I base coated the smoke and the khaki stone areas with graphite, I'm going to keep highlighting up on the stone parts with scale colors Thar Brown and Mojave White. Now, if you want a more in-depth breakdown and showing how I actually paint this technique, how I get the textures, you can check out my previous videos for Colossus, for Doctor Strange, and for Baron Mortal, where I break down the technique a little bit more. Suffice to say, we're just building up through those colors using our brush strokes to create texture and apply uh, some material to the surface. You're also going to want to pay attention, in particular for this particular model, um, the placement of your highlights. So with our Hulk Buster, we're going to have a primary highlight on the front here, and then we're going to brighten up the areas around the smoke where I imagine the, the, the jet stream or the, the energy blast is coming through and it's creating a bit of brightness around the smoke area. So we'll incorporate some highlighting into um, these areas here and we'll highlight our quote unquote painted textures accordingly. To paint the terracotta stone and we want to make sure that we're painting all of the brick elements first before we tackle the smoke. This way any sort of bleed or color glow, we can glaze on top of any brickwork or stonework or any detail on the base without worrying about having to touch anything up. So the colors we're going to be using for the terracotta brick now is Scale Colors African Shadow, Kalahari Orange, and Basic Flush. And then to paint the mortar in between, we're going to be using Vallejo's Tan Earth and Ice Yellow. Now once again, I have recorded an in-depth breakdown and a more um, thorough demonstration in previous videos, specifically Colossus and Baron Mordo. So again, I highly recommend you check it out. It's the same basic technique that we're using on the terracotta stone or the khaki stone, just different colors. For painting this brickwork, I do highly recommend painting the mortar first before going back in and doing the uh, terracotta stone on top. So we're going to start with a base coat of tan earth, and then we're going to highlight that mortar work with ice yellow. From there, we're going to base coat the stones on top, leaving the mortar work showing with our African shadow, and we'll make sure that we base coat the copper sewer grate as well. From there, we're just mixing in progressive amounts of Kalahari orange and basic flesh into our African shadow to create the terracotta color, using our brush strokes to create the texture and focusing our highlights near the front of the base here, and then some near the back where the smoke meets. Remember, as you're beginning to highlight the terracotta stone as well, not to highlight the bricks individually, but to treat the entire thing as one whole and to make your highlights consistent front to back. Much like when we're painting the armor, we want to make sure that we're not highlighting to the edge of each stone individually, but um, treating as one flat surface with these lines in between. So we want to keep the highlights stronger in the front and weaker as we get progressively back and back. And to help sell a bit of that patchwork brick, I gave a couple of random stones a little extra brighter highlight just to uh, differentiate them from the rest of the stones and give a little bit more um, randomness and break up some of that uniformity. So by now, and if you've gotten to this point in the model, you should be an expert in painting non-metal metal. So I'm really not going to be diving too deep into the techniques for painting the uh, streetcar rail and the sewer grate, but I will walk through the recipe 
and just briefly touch on considering sort of your placement of light and shadow. So our color recipe is AK Dark Sea Blue, Gray Blue, Spectrum Blue, and Greenish White. So I've already done my base coat of the Dark Sea Blue, and essentially it's a, a blend or a progression through these four colors. Because I want the uh, rail to have a bit of wear and tear, we're gonna work quickly through and not gonna focus too much on um, making sure my blends are perfectly smooth. I'm okay with a couple of brush strokes uh, being errant and just sort of implying a bit of scratchiness, a bit of wear and tear to the surface. And then insofar as the placement of where the lights are going to be, of course, we're going front to back. The primary light source is coming straight down like this, and there's a big open gap in between his arms and legs. So we're going to have some highlighting shine through. And then as we sort of pull into shadow here where his foot is, we're going to add a secondary light source reflecting off of his boot right here and then from the smoke right here. So essentially we're going to end up with three little um, blots or uh, spots of color um, or highlight as it were. So in the front here, a softer one here, and then one matching it right here and in the back. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just using quick jumps or quick transitions in terms of the colors to quickly block in and sort of place up where I want my general highlights to be. And I'll throw in little spots, little extra um, subtle dots of highlights just to keep it interesting. And then I'll go back in with some glazes of um, all of my different mid-tones and my base tone and smooth it all together. There'll probably be a little bit of a highlight here where the two rails meet. We're going to get some light bouncing in between the two. And then you'll want to put a highlight on each edge because it's going to be reflecting from the stone around it. I'm being a little broad with my highlights for now because I'm going to be sharpening them and refining them as I work my way up into Spectrum Blue and then Greenish White. So from gray blue, we're going to keep working our way into spectrum blue. And you can already see that I've started to use my gray blue to imply some scratches, some texture. And then where the rails do meet, uh, just to have that little consistency, like they're, they've are they been joined for a while and they're seeing the same sort of wear and tear, carry your highlights and your damage across. And as we continue to brighten up our highlights, we'll keep adding extra levels of scratchiness. And then particularly on the edge of the rail, there's no need to do a super consistent line. By creating a bit of undulation, having some extra brighter spots, you give the impression that it's sort of a um, beaten and worn edge. And then finally, we'll use greenish white to finish off our highlighting. I don't think I'm going to be taking the non metal metal on the base up to white. And that's largely just because I want all of the focus to be on the Hulk Buster. I don't want large spots of white on the base just competing for attention. Um, and this is more just an artistic choice for myself. So we're going to focus this greenish white on the brightest spots. I'm just going to stipple this color out. I have it nice and diluted on the palette, so it's very easy to glaze out, build up that layer of color. And then on the edges, we're going to go with some very, very sharp highlights. And then adding some bright spots where we have scratches that cut across the edge. Just to help simulate a little bit of that um, extra wear. Basically what's happening is 
Um, I'm simulating sort of a scratch in that corner. So there's a, a, a bit of a larger um, cut in the surface of the material or the edge that's catching a little bit more light. And this will help to reinforce the idea that these scratches actually exist. To paint the copper super grate on top of our scale color African Shadow, we're going to be using AK Saddle Brown, Deep Brown, Scale Colors to Nair Yellow, and then Games Workshop Vanilla Hack Oxide to add a bit of rust and oxidation. Let me just get some of this African Shadow to neaten up the edge from when we were painting the brick. And then once again, we're just working our way through these colors. You can jump right into the silent brown. I'm not really going to mix, um, especially for something this small, this tiny. Um, too many intermediary steps, at least from the African shadow to the silent brown. And once again, always just remember, consider your highlights, your primary light source and your secondary light source. What is illuminating the object? So our primary light source is coming from this direction. We're going to have a bright spot somewhere around here. And I'm going to put a secondary softer one right here and here. Just what I imagine is bouncing off of um, sort of the suit and the smoke. So from pure saddle brown, we just start mixing in that tenor yellow. Start to brighten up this copper. This edge needs to be brightened up a little bit too. And I'll just throw in some little um, extra highlight spots, some solar ones just like we did on the, the rail to add a little bit more visual interest to the surface. And the goal of this highlighting is to work our way up to pretty much pure tenarium. Paint the actual manhole cover itself. What I recommend doing is doing a uh, sh shadow or base coat to mid-tone blend on the entire thing itself, and then highlight each of these raised, um, not rivets, but like the little raised details, highlight individually, and according to the highlights that we have placed around on the edge. And we'll take pure tenor yellow and we'll do a nice crisp edge highlight on both sides of this manhole cover. We'll finish by applying some vanilla hack oxide to create a very subtle rust effect. So basically wherever you imagine water to collect and to pull, I'm going to concentrate some in the 
creases and edges here and collect some in between some of these uh, divots as well. Now, all I'm doing is I'm loading my brush and I'm using capillary action to help the paint flow and pull around into these crevices and into these joints. This color will dry on very subtle. So if you want a stronger, more saturated color look, you may have to do two or three coats of Milac Oxide. Now this color looks best when it's contrasting a lot of this orange and a lot of this yellow. So I recommend concentrating this vanilla hack oxide in sort of your mid and dark tones of the copper. If you put it on the yellow, it gets a little lost in my opinion. So to do some of the prep work on the smoke, we're gonna do this in two phases. So the first is we're gonna be hand painting it with the brush, and then we're gonna go back in with some titanium white ink to do a bit of glazing, softening up those blends and really pushing it into the white. So the four colors we're gonna use on top of our base coat of graphite, which we've already got on the model, we're gonna use medium sea gray, pale gray, and white. So we're just progressing through these colors um, Following the patterning of the smoke, so there's a bit of a spiral on this cluster right here. And we're just going to pick one of the facings to be the top. And then we're going to highlight that spiral around to create sort of this interesting pattern, this sort of um, wispy, smoky shape. Because we're going to be doing a lot of glazes of this white ink, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about um, being perfectly smooth, not looking for um, a perfect blend at this stage. We're just looking to sort of block in some of the underlying shape or the underlying texture so that when we glaze our titanium white on top, um, it'll create the white to gray blend that we're looking for while maintaining sort of that underlying patterning and that sort of uh, smokiness to it. You can see how rough and quick and sketchy I'm being with this. Just be careful as you get up to the base of the foot that you don't accidentally um, push brush strokes or any paint onto the model itself. And we're going to keep highlighting this through our various colors of pale gray up to white. And with the white, you don't have to push it all the way to white. Like 50-50 pale gray white mix should be sufficient. Once we get to the white ink, it will um, continue to push that highlight up. If you leave the paint a little bit wet on the model, you can do actually a bit of wet blending. And that will help make it easier to transition up through some higher jumps or some quicker value jumps much more easily. Now, when we get to the base of the smoke, where we really want to concentrate our highlighting is in this internal structure right here. You can bring some highlights up to the top and around and sort of accentuate some of these um, billows or these clouds, but really you want to make sure that you always bring it back to this central portion right here. Because this is where the direct blast is coming from. This is going to be the um, quote unquote hottest or brightest part of the smoke where we want to glaze in some of our orange and yellows and reds afterwards. So we need to make sure that we have a bright center here to get the glazes to be um, as rich and vibrant as possible. And then as we pull off to the edge, we can sort of fade it into our um, medium sea gray and graphite. As we're highlighting up the smoke as well, 
don't be afraid to be scratchy and um, stipple your brush, do a lot of dot patterns. Um, just have fun with the texture of it. The, the stippling I find as well can be really a useful way to add sort of that debris into that smoke, sort of like there's um, stuff flying around in the, the smoke trail without a whole lot of extra effort. Without going back in, if we're just sort of stippling away as we create our highlights, we're also creating that texture at the same time. And you see, I'm just continuing to be very loose, very sketchy with this. I'm not trying to blend everything perfectly. I'm focusing on accentuating the form and the volumes of this smoke. And I'm really trying to play with the texture here. And as we get brighter and brighter, we're going to get thinner and thinner and thinner with our paneling. And we're going to get more and more of these little uh, spirals and uh, smoke streams in the, I guess, in the, the exhaust. As we get again to the base of this exhaust thing, you want to brighten it up so that we're also going to be achieving a white highlight at the very base of this, this entire cluster. And for our final highlight on the smoky rings, that pale gray and white mixed to about 50-50, and we're going to really concentrate this on the base of the boot. And once again, I am just stippling and dabbing my brush away, not really using a straight line to create the, uh, the smoke plume, the pattern, but a lot of little dots. So I'm just smushing my brush quickly across the surface. So now we're going to use some of our Liquitix uh, Titanium White Ink. I've loaded in the airbrush, diluted, I would say, probably um, three or four parts ink to one part water. It's still very watery, but I want it just to be a little diluted. And then I have my compressor set to about 25 PSI. And we're just going to slowly build up the color. Making sure you're doing lots of thin layers and then using the airbrush to air dry, but without pushing or spreading the ink everywhere. Don't let it pull. Um, if it starts to spider, it's gonna be very difficult to correct. And we're just gonna slowly use the airbrush to glaze in the white and brighten all these spots up. Take your time. Um, you'll have to do many, many passes to build up the titanium white because it is very thin. And even if you overspray just a little bit onto the boot, if you're spraying underneath, don't get it on the red. It'll help to um, sort of get that glow effect happening. <laughs> 
Yep, the soft blue underglow of the boot on the smoke. We're gonna use our, what is this? Blue green. And this is the same color, if you remember, as the base coat for all of the orbs. This will help the simulator sell the effect that it's a continuance of materials. I have this diluted about five parts water to one part paint, and then my compressor is set to about 15 PSI. And we're just gonna gently underspray this. I'm gonna try and spray in a direction that captures some of those undercuts of the spiral, but maintaining the um, some of our white highlights. What you wanna do is you wanna slowly um, pull back the trigger, release a little bit of your color, and then just use the airbrush to air dry. And we're just gonna use this to consecutively build up these colors, this layer of color, and basically glaze with the airbrush. I'm gonna use some Vallejo Ink Yellow, mixed to about 50-50, and I'm gonna do the same um, that we do with the blue, but concentrating on the base of the rocket exhaust. I'm gonna go back in by hand with some glazes of my game ink yellow, just to really increase the saturation in the center. And then I'm gonna follow up with some glazes of Vallejo orange red. And I really concentrate this color right in some of the deepest cracks. I'm going to use some soft glazes of white paint. Make sure they're nice and diluted. And we're just going to bring back some of these sort of white highlights at the base of the boot. Keep the layers nice and thin, and we're just looking to glaze in these very soft highlights. Don't want to overpower the blue. We just want to bring back some of the spiral motion. And I did end up with a bit of overspray, some spattering from the airbrush, which was unfortunate. I think there was some debris that were caught in there. So what I'm going to be doing is going back in with my various gray tones and just touching up the smoke um, bits and pieces, like for example here, um, where I want to sort of get rid of that overspray, maybe I'll use some of my pale gray and just neaten some of these areas up. Remember that acrylic paints um, dry darker than they actually appear when you apply them. So when you go and apply these areas, um, make sure that you're going a little brighter than you think you have to, and then really feather these layers out to try and at least smooth out those transitions. For my final glazing step, I'm gonna be using two colors from Chimera. They're phthalo green and magenta. And we're just gonna do some very soft glazes over the model, just in certain spots to really bump up some of our contrast and our saturation. So in our areas of deep shadow, mainly in the cool side where I wanna sort of accentuate this um, shadow tone, this deepness to it, I'm gonna dilute my phthalo green very heavily and just gently glaze this color in. I want it to be very soft and slowly build up this green. I don't want to go too heavy right away. So the basic color theory is that because green and red are complementary colors, when you use the two side by side, it can really be, um, or it'll help perceptually increase the vibrancy of both colors. And so 
the thought behind this is by using the green into the shadows of this red, even if I'm not necessarily changing the value too much, the eye is going to perceive that extra depth, that extra layer of um, contrast in there, and the color will seem darker and have a little bit more punch than it actually does. That's a theory anyway, though. Um, the exact sort of shade of red and green, as well as your local colors around it, will impact. So really just play it by ear. At the very least, it's rule of cool and it'll add a, a subtle green tone into some of the shadows. And I'll do the same for the magenta in some of these larger areas where I feel like maybe I want to push the color a little bit more, um, sort of add a bit more warmth, a little bit more riches to it. So I'll just, much like with the phthalo green, have a very nice diluted layer of color and just gently glaze that in just enough to shift the value a little bit, the saturation, sorry, without changing the overall color. You can see just a very thin coat of it adds so much. Remember, the goal right now is to nuance. Um, we're not looking to make big sweeping changes. We want to be subtle. We'll just go ahead and we'll repeat this process over the entire model, just take our time. Um, injecting these glazes wherever we feel like we could use a little bit more of those um, saturations. And don't be afraid to use this color into the gold as well. The green can help push some of these shadows into a cooler range, but the magenta in particular can really be used to help add a little bit more richness and warmth to this gold. So I would use the magenta on the gold in sort of the warmer spots and then use the Fallow green and some of the cooler spots. So the last thing to paint on our miniature, apart from the little things in the base, is to do some final white highlights. So again, just using pure white, nice and diluted, we're going to pick out some, some highlights and some edges that uh, deserve a little bit of reinforcing, and we're going to mainly focus this on the head and areas of the chest. And by using this color white um, this sparingly, the goal is to pull focus to this part of the model uh, because this will suddenly be the brightest part, um, never mind some of the light glazes on the smoke here. Um, the eye will naturally draw into the head and the chest. Maybe we're going to get to this red armor, maybe instead of doing it on the edge. We'll add a little spot on the corner there. I'll go ahead and repeat this over the entire model, just sort of picking these little, um, little details, these little corners, these edges to just add a little bit of extra pop. 
So what I've got here are a couple of posters that I want to put on the base, and I want to use them to help um, simulate the sort of the blasting, billowing motion that um, the smoke and the clouds from the base is having. So I sort of pre-shaped them, and I sort of just mangled them with uh, my hands and fingers. And what we're going to do is we're going to be using Mod Podge and some water to essentially paper mache these things on. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of Mod Podge. And it's basically like um, white glue or PVA glue. Um, only when it dries, it'll dry much clearer and thinner without the residue that PVA glue would normally have. So you can see I'm just tucking it in, and then the goal is when it, um, with the way it folds, it's like it's being blasted out. And then I have another one that I'm going to do the exact same thing on for the front. And I'm just going to slip it somewhere. Um, maybe there. So off camera, I felt like two wasn't enough, so I cut a third one and I was just figuring out where to place it. Um, again, same thing, just using some tweezers in my hands and fingers as just um, shaped the, the paper until it was in sort of the placement and motion that I want. And then used a bit of Mod Podge just to dab and glue it down. What we're going to do now is um, once that initial um, layer of Mod Podge has dried, we're just going to apply a couple of thin coats onto the paper. And we'll use this opportunity to, to maybe use a little bit of water um, finalize the shape and placement of the paper. And if you've ever done paper mache as a child, or even as an adult with children, you know that as you do more and more layers and as the glue and the water dry, it causes the paper to harden and become pretty solid. So it's not really going to give unless you take your finger and you poke it or you, you prod it. So it'll stay. Um, it's not going to just get blown off or whatever. And I'm going to do like four or five passes of this Mod Podge over all of the paper. And then I'll set it aside to dry um, probably for about 10, 15 minutes. The Mod Podge doesn't take too long. Once our Mod Podge is dry, it's time to finish up with some weathering powders. I'm using a 50-50 mix of dark yellow ochre and burnt umber. I have this pre-mix in a, a little container here because I use this color on all of my Marvel models. It's a great way to introduce a, a common color across the entire collection so that even if every model on top has a completely different color palette, um, having all the bases done the same way gives me two or three colors depending on if there's copper or silver on there. I've got the terracotta, I've got the khaki. And then if I introduce some of this weathering powder as well, it's just another way that I can help to unify my entire collection. And this way as well, when I'm building rosters or I'm picking and choosing models, I can literally grab anything off of my collection, put it together, and I know that it will work together. So we're just going to, and I apologize if it's difficult to get the angle uh, with Hulkbuster sitting on top, Basically, just gently collect some of this weathering powder uh, at the base of the smoke. I imagine it being blown up and sort of being caught up in the swirls. I'll make sure to catch a little bit on the brick as well, but not too much. I really like how this has um, been rendered and, and textured, so I don't want it to get too dirty. So instead, I'll focus a little bit more on this khaki stone instead. And then make sure that you get some of this on the newspaper as well. Um, help to sell that this is a dusty environment and that the newspaper has sort of been there and it's being blown around. It's litter that's been on the ground and not some fresh thing off of the rack. 
make sure you get the backs of the newspapers as well. Otherwise, you just have a very clean, um, boring white sheet uh, blowing around. Once we're happy with the effect, we're going to use some mineral spirits. I have this loaded into a spritzer bottle. And we're just going to liberally douse the entire base wherever we've applied this weathering powder. And this will add as a, uh, act as a fixer and secure those powders to the base. So we'll let that evaporate. And once it's fully dry, we'll paint the base trim black, apply a varnish of choice. I'll be using Games Workshop's Purity Seal for this and our model is complete and ready for the tabletop. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informative and I hope it gives you a lot more insight and understanding just in terms of sort of core fundamental or foundational knowledge that you can then begin to apply to your own painting. And hopefully it'll make your non monomala painting much stronger in the future. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a like and check out my other videos on YouTube. If you wanna follow my other social media platforms, I'll make sure to drop links in the video description below. And as always, until next time, happy hobbying.